One one of the questions, one of the, one of the things why we were thinking uh, to get your to get you on the show was a little bit uh, last week we we were talking about some of the winners of an underwater photo competition. You are a a quite uh, a well known and frequent judge of different kind of photo competitions, whether it be BB City Wildlife, whether it be Underwater Photography Year, um, lots of different ones that you're involved with all the time. We wanted to sort of pick your brain a little bit about some of the some of the things that you take into consideration when judging a photo competition. Yeah, it's, it's a subject I'm, I'm very happy to speak about. I think I think one of the things that's slightly different about me compared to a lot of the judges is that I still enter photographic competitions. Okay. And so I, I, I've always with with Underwater Photography of the Year, which is obviously the competition that I. Um, it was you know, a big part of setting up, and I really wanted to do all the things in that competition that I wanted as an entrant. So we've right. always tried to be as open and transparent about the judging process as we possibly can be, because I think that as an entrant, that's always what I wanted. And so that's driven so many of the decisions in that competition, is, tr is trying to, to get those things right. So I, I'm, you know, and, and I've obviously, having done a lot of it, um, and actually one thing, you know, down the years, I, you know, have judged most of the big underwater competitions that are out there, you know, over the last 20 years. I've judged most of the major wildlife photography competitions as well. And having done all that, I've seen the things I like and things I don't like. Um, but I wish there was, I think across the board, I wish there was more transparency. Mm -hmm. I think every competition that's out there, you know, the, the main, the first thing they tell you is who the judges are. And then they tell you about the prizes to get you to enter. And... I think one thing that a lot of them are getting are not doing is that a lot of the time the name judges don't do the bulk of the judging. They choose the winners, but the organizers create the finalist group. Oh. So say a competition gets a thousand entries, the judges often only get to see thirty to fifty pictures. Right. Ah. Because you know, the, the organizers are I kind of know. saying, Well, these busy guys, they, they we can't send them, email them a thousand pictures and tell them to pick their favourites. Mm. So we'll do that for them. I don't have a, a big problem with that, but I think the competition should be more open. You know, they should say, um, the, you know, the, the team here will, will judge the first round because a lot of these contests are saying, we want you to pay 10 bucks a picture. And the reason you're entering our competition is because of these big name photographers who are going to be looking at your work. And then they don't see it. And it, it actually puts people like me in an awkward situation because I get people emailing me going, hey, I entered this amazing shot in the contest. Mm -hmm. And then, what did you think of it? And I'm like, I never saw it, you know, because yeah, it was right. out before me. And so I don't have a problem with competitions doing it like that, but I think they should be more open, especially when they're charging money to enter. Yeah. I, I also, yeah. from a personal point of view, okay. um, yeah, no, it, it's quite widespread. And so with UPY and, and, and the other big competitions, um, like the wildlife talk about, you know, with UPY anyway, which is the one I can talk about most openly, all the name judges see every single picture and we see every single picture together. So no sitting on your own in a dark room, half asleep, just going delete, delete, delete. You know, we all go through and, put, and you know, I would happily record our judging process and put the whole thing online, mm -hmm. except that it's, you know, it takes 36 hours or whatever. Yeah, and it'd it, be it's the a very really long ever. process. But we would, you know, there's nothing that we say or do that we would want behind closed doors. It's just, you know, and we did record it the first year, actually. I know, just like, we can't show it. It's just boring. It's just us staring at Kringle going, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> But it's, um, and, and I think I think the other thing as well is that I think across the board, we I've always, with UPY, paid all the judges for their judging time. And I think that all these competitions, and, you know, say this to you as, as industry pros, we as pros who are asked to judge things, we should ask to get paid for judging competitions. It's a considerable drain on time. Um, these competitions are using our names to gain entries and generate their income. And I think if you actually paid judges, they'd put more effort into it. I think one of the problems is you ask these people to do it, they go, yeah, 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 yeah. I'll do it. And then you send them an email saying, okay, here's the top 50, choose your favorites. And they're like, I'm busy, I've got this deadline, I'm about to go away on a right, trip. Right, so they might do that it's quick. Easy. Done, yeah. And I think if you pay people, you'd actually get them to sit down and go, okay, I'll happily look at the top 500 pictures because you're paying me, yeah. you know, a couple of hundred bucks. And I know it's not, 
you know, I'm obviously going to spend a few hours on this, and my my hour rate is you know is more than that. But I appreciate the gesture, right? And I think that would be a much better system to have. I have a um, question, and that's about, what we... about on the judge criteria. Is uh, mm. do you also put in the judge in the judging panel uh, maybe somebody that uh, is not an underwater photographer? Um, it varies competition to competition, um, and I think what is important is you tell ahead of time the entrance what the panel is going to be like. And some panels can be dominated by editors. Some panels can be dominated by photographers. I personally think that underwater photographers are happiest with the results when the panel is dominated by photographers. Yes. But what you don't want is you don't want photographers that are all clones of each other, or you have one very well-known photographer and a load of yes men or yes women. Okay. Um, you need photographers that will um, challenge each other. That yeah, I have different opinions, will fight their corners, but are not, I think one of the biggest problems you see on judging panels is photographers that are not willing to, to compromise. And I think most photographers, we work on our own and all our decisions about our photography are ours. We're our own boss, we're like, I want it to look like this, this is what's great. And what you find with a lot of good photographers when you get them on a judging panel is they're so set in their way of doing things, they're like, this is right, that's wrong. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons why we have what seems from the outside a very undiverse judging panel with UPY. We have just three judges. We're all British, we're all male, we're all white. You think, but myself, Martin Edge and Peter Rollins, I think is the best judging panel I've ever judged with. And it's why I want to keep it that way for so long because we have completely different taste in images. We're all known well in the community, so people want our opinions, but that's a lesser point. But because we all respect each other, we all really listen to each other. And the UPY collection is in no way the result of any one of us. It's, it's always the result of the three of us. Mm -hmm. And there are winners every year that I really just don't get, but Martin or Peter absolutely adores, and that's fine. And we, we listen to each other, we talk each other around, and it's that which I think creates a really great collection. When you have you know, strong minds, different tastes, and then that ability to talk to each other and listen to each other. And so many big name photographers I've judged with can't listen. You right. mentioned Just something there. Like... You, you, you mentioned something oh, there that yeah. all of you are, uh, you have different likes in uh, photography. Can you explain a little bit this? What you like, what Martin H likes and... Yeah, I, I would say, I mean, it, it varies a little bit. I would say I'm the most consistent judge of the three of them, probably because I'm the most immersed in active underwater photography. So I know all the up-to-date trends. I know all the techniques. You know, I would say 99.9% .9 of pictures in, in UPY, I see them, I know exactly how they're taken. Mm -hmm. And you guys were talking with Joe the other week about how he shot the You know, I see that shot, I know exactly how he's taken it. Um, just because I'm teaching techniques, I'm you know, doing underwater photography. Um, Martin and Peter generally don't. So they react much more artistically than me. Okay. They're just like, I like that, I don't like it. Um, Martin is a very artistic guy. You, you know, although he writes technical books on how to take underwater photos, he's a really artistically tuned in. And, it, you know, if pictures hit him in the heart, he loves them. And so, whereas I'm very much more, you know, if it's in the head. And then Peter's, you know, got a great deal of expertise, probably sees lots and lots of pictures, um, has his favorites, of course. Um, but I'd say the two of them are much more changeable. You know, for me, if, if you showed me the winners from, if you showed me the entry from the first year we ran UPY, I'd pick all the same pictures now that I picked then. Whereas the two of them really change a lot. You know, they're just like, yeah, this is what I love today. And I think that's really, although it sounds like a bad thing, it's actually really important because they're just reacting emotionally, emotionally to yes. what they're seeing. And that's, um, that's, that's and great. Otherwise, uh, you know, we might figure it out your minds and we know exactly what you like every time. So, Yeah, and, and the way we judge is, I would say that those two speak more than me, but I control the mouse. So I, you know, I did the, the computer side a bit. Of so I make sure, for me, my goal with UPY is that we have a, it's a collection of images that you really, that the community really wants to see every single one. Because, you know, so we, we definitely want diversity within our awarded images, you know, so that's going to affect, you know, if you have two amazing pictures, but they're quite similar, 
probably we won't award one of them, certainly in the same category. You know, so um, I, I like to take care of that side of things and I just let those two run with it. And it's, it's really enjoyable. But I have to say, judging competitions is also very stressful. And I think it's something that people maybe don't see from the outside is no one is, is judged as harshly as the judges. You know, everyone has an opinion on the end of the winners of every competition. And you're very aware, you know, about making mistakes, that you could award a picture that breaks a rule that is taken in a way that, you know, you, you know, obviously all around the world, new subjects, new things come up. You don't know whether that way of posing that animal in this way is, is you know, if it's something completely new. Now, I've done a, enough diving and I'm pretty clued up yeah. um, to have a pretty good idea. And every year we exclude a huge number of pictures because we think Many it's ways. either manipulated or it's we don't want to promote that type of picture because it could lead others to manipulate it in order to reproduce it. Okay. Right. That's like a very good uh, takeaway, actually, from just what you said. If somebody wants to enter a competition, even if you got that shot that you think like it was natural, but if, if it gives that impression that maybe could be manipulated into that, uh, don't uh, don't put that uh, image through because it could get rejected. Yeah, so, so we're always really careful in, in that. That said, the, a lot of the pictures you get entered in competitions are people's most amazing thing they've seen. So, of course, you get to see, and, and you guys, you know, all the diving you've done, you've seen some things you're like, yeah. if I saw a photo of that, I'd say it's manipulated, but actually right. it's happening completely naturally. And there's a, a photo that I often talk about when we're judging and we're having these long debates. Um, I think it's taken by... A uh, guy called Dragos, and it's it's a a sand perch sitting on top of a blue ring octopus, and obviously you can't manipulate that because of the nature of the subject. Yeah. But if that was a nudibranch on top of a frogfish, you'd immediately say manipulate it. Right. That's right. And so amazing things can happen, and I think you have to have a little bit of of understanding that just because something is not something you haven't seen doesn't mean it's manipulated. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, our, go our driving forces, we don't want to promote that. All that said, I think, I would say three years ago in the contest, we were getting a lot of manipulated pictures. And that number has obviously manipulated pictures. That number has really nosedived. And now I would say we get far, far less. However, I actually think that there's still a lot of manipulation going on out there. But the photographers... Are, or the guides and photographers working together are manipulating in a way that creates a naturalistic looking image. Right. So, you know, That's I go diving, you know, I see, you know, what goes on. Not, you know, we talk to our guides and they behave brilliantly, but I know that those same guides, when they're with another photographer, will do what the photographer asks them to do. And, you know, you swim, you know, a lot of the dive sites, they're busy, you see other photographers working. Um, you know, there's lots of manipulation going on, but these days it's not okay, we'll grab that subject and put it on top of this and it'll look great. It's now, we'll grab that subject and we know that it sometimes lives on this, so we'll put it on that in a nice place. Yeah. And then you end up with a picture that as a judge, well, that animal lives with that subject or that nudibranch feeds on that type, you know, that Nembrotha mm. feeds on that type of tunicate. So, yeah, it could be on there. Right. But ha you know, so I think there's probably still manipulation going on, but it's at a level that in the judging room you can't pick up on. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a little bit grayer. Clever, clever manipulation. And yeah, we, and yeah, but I guess at least that then doesn't spawn copycat type stuff because it's actually reasonably natural. One, and, one thing, and it doesn't. One thing you mentioned earlier, you were talking about how um, you were talking about you know you being on top a little bit more about the the latest trends and and that kind of thing, and talking about the manipulation, you'll see on social media when there's an obvious manipulated subject or a photo that's been out there, say, uh, there's a, several examples over the recent years of, say, the shrimp in between the rhinophores of a nudie or something like that, uh, and it creates a big blowback. And that's what you're alluding to now. You don't, you don't want to um, put that in the forefront on, on your judging. But how much, if you're really aware of that, how much... Are both Peter and Martin, if they're not as you know into the social media side of things, are they also aware of that mm. issue? Yeah, I'd say Peter's very careful about that. Martin doesn't come into you know he's you no know, you know he's he's technical, but he's, you know it, it, he's very much it's about the image. Martin's a real details guy as well with images. You know, um, you know 
you know, it can be an amazing shot and there might be a detail in it that will just make him hate it or a detail in it that will make him love it. Right. You know, um, but it's, you know, we, they also, you know, they, they, we all have, you know, quite overlapping tastes as well as being diverse. Um, but obviously my, you know, I'm diving a lot more than those guys. I've dived all around the world more recently than those guys generally. And um, I, I, my background is a marine biologist, so they tend to defer to me. Um, we do also, we do still email the odd person outside. Um, we've got some good, you know, good contacts that were like, what do you think about this? And we'll send it out to some scientists, friends of ours, or photographers, and get a little bit of extra feedback. Um, but yeah, um, you know, I don't think we don't, we basically take the attitude that if this is not the sort of picture we want to promote, we'll kick it out. That's and then good. we don't have to have a long debate about whether it was manipulated or not. Right. We just yeah. say, it's not the picture, not move yeah. on. Yeah. Makes sense. But yeah, well, you know, you know, it's, you know, you're not infallible, but I think it's something that, that as a judge, and it's not just that, it's also technique wise, you might fall in love with a picture and then later on find out that actually this is something that is being set up and staged and loads of people have done it and you just, not seen it before mm -hmm. or something. So there's, there's elements that we, you know, we want to. Um, and, and I think the other thing I'd say is we are quite keen to show the diversity of underwater photography in a way that not all of our, not everyone appreciates. You know, it's not a nature photography competition. You know, we like pictures of people in, we like shipwreck, we have a shipwreck category. Um, and I think that's important is to remind people that underwater photography is more than just who can find the coolest critter or who's got the nicest black water shot. There's people doing cool stuff in swimming pools, in yep. freshwater rivers, all around. And I think that's something we really, you know, working with weird, you know, you know, we had you know, really cool bear shots a few years ago. And just, we really like that underwater photography is more than just going on a scuba dive and shooting fish. Gotcha. Although most of our winners are in that category. Um, we like that variety. How much do, uh, how much do, do trends, or oh, as again, Coming back to the three of you. It's a really good question. I don't trend, know trends it. seem to be, you know, you, you'll get two or three years in a row where you've got this one sort of trendy photo that uh, a few years ago it was snooting. Now it's uh, it's blur and things like that where yeah. you get a, a, a trend that keeps coming along. Um, you, as you say, you're on top of the social media and looking a little bit more at the current trends that people are doing and teaching some of them and things like that. The other two may be not as much as yourself. Um, how much do trends have a, a I don't know, what's, uh, uh, impact. A, an impact on the judging panel? So I would say that in, in UPY terms, Martin and Peter couldn't give a toss about trends at all. And for them, it's all about the image. Right. They love the image, they love it. Whether it's fancy, whether it's normal, you know. And we always award plenty of classic shots. I would say in terms of the entrance, um, yes, you clearly see trends massively um, in the entrance. I think what most people would be shocked about if they actually saw all the entry was how the cutting edge trends are incredibly widespread mm -hmm. because there might be one or two guys posting those pictures on Facebook who they know. So they're like, oh, yeah, just a couple of guys are doing that. And actually, when you get the entry to UPY, you realize that most photographers are doing it and they're all entering it into the competition. And, you know, you know, someone say, oh, that person's really well known for a hey, like, snooty blur shot or something. And then actually come the competition, you find out there's 30 or 40 photographers doing it and they're all entering two pictures. And suddenly there's 90 of them. Yep. You know, we do, you know, with Blackwater is, you know, That's people think, oh, there's only a few people doing it. We have so many Blackwater shots. You know, we're jo you know, joking that, you know, they call it a blanket octopus because it sends the judges to sleep and we need to snuggle up with a blanket. <laughs> and it's not because blanket octopuses are common and they're beautiful and amazing animals. But everyone who shoots one enters it in the competition. Yes. And yeah. suddenly you get your finalists, you know, in macro or blackwater category. And there's like 50 or 60 of them. And you're just like, oh, my God, they're all the same. They all right. look the same. There's so many of them. And I think actually the best advice I can give anyone with competition is enter what you have that other people don't have. Um, and remember that people are all going to enter their, you know, what they think is, is trendy or they've just got. And actually, I think you can have a lot of success by finding pictures that you have that are perhaps a little bit different. Yeah. And, you know, the number of people who think they're doing something different 
And actually, they'd be amazed how many other people are doing exactly that same different thing. Okay. And then actually, the other guy, you know, like our, our winning macro shot this year, I mean, it, last year, um, all our winning macro shots were for Asia. But this year, our winning macro shot was a Caribbean shot. Right. And, you know, and the second place, I think, was from Japan. And, you know, so it's, you know, how do you, you know, find finding something slightly different, something original, rather than, you know, and we had, you know, a huge number of amazing Asian blackwater pictures. And UPY, we don't have a raw check thing, which makes it a lot easier for blackwater people who are diving in less good visibility. You don't have to go to French Polynesia to get clear water because you, you know, to get, to have no backscatter. Um, and I think, you know, so we have amazing, amazing blackwater stuff, but it, it's all quite samey. Yep. You, know, uh, you know, when you see, you know, it's amazing until you have 500 of them on your desktop and then they become quite samey and you know obviously yeah. we, we so the competition um, amongst the, that those shots so the bar gets set very very high so if you want to win yes. the black water uh, night dive shot you need to have that really fantastic amazing shot that can impress all the three judges in uh, upi why like yes that's a fantastic shot which is very difficult to do that but when you have that yeah, uh, and, and that different shot it comes in as a let's say a, a breath of fresh air right after you see so many black water and so on and it can capture your attention more than actually the the more trendy shot uh, technique yeah absolutely and, and, and it's also it's just a, a human nature thing in that if you see um i can and i mean like 500 of, of anything and one thing stands out you know, so, you know, like if you, you know, a, a beautiful blonde girl in Sweden is not going to stand out. You know, you could come to, to Bali and she stands out. Whereas you take a, a Balinese girl to Sweden, she's going to really stand out and look amazing. Uh, you know, in, 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 no. so it's a competition. You're competing with the other images in there. And as an entrant, you should think a little bit about that. What is everyone else going to put in? Because if you're putting in something similar to them, you're less likely to stand out. Now, of right. course, we still award you know amazing black water shots um but it's perhaps harder to win with one of those than it is with someone who's maybe doing their own thing and if you're shooting what the dive guy tells you to shoot all the time you're probably doing the same thing as everyone else um and, but it's ultimately we just want to choose the best pictures we don't put as that much thought into it but i th think you can think about how the judges might be thinking about things if they're trying to choose the pictures that are most outstanding most remarkable what about what about something like between, say, something up, setting up something that's technically difficult, uh, spending a lot of time getting like say something, uh, for instance, one of your winning shots from a few years ago, where it was a nighttime shot where you had the jack uh, creating those trails. I believe it was the European Photographer of the Year competition where where you mm -hmm. won something like that. So that uh, is a technical setup that took a lot of time um, to get it right. Where so you look at a, a picture like that, or you look at something that's just specifically someone at the right place at the right time caught an amazing bit of behavior of an animal eating something or spawning or, or you know a pygmy seahorse putting out little babies pygmy seahorses and things like that. What which would have a greater impact on your um, scoring as a judging? So I think we would never go into UPY saying we want one over the other. It's very much about reacting to them as images. And I would say, and it's not about deconstructing how they were made or the effort involved in taking them. Um, because, you know, you, you don't always know that. And I think you judge them within their genres. So you'd say, is that the most amazing technological step forward in, in rec photography? Or, you know, to say a really, you know, complicated, it's particularly the rec photography is doing a lot with off-camera lighting and really complicated shots, often in very deep water, you know, doing some amazing stuff. Or is that behavior shot really incredible? Because maybe that photographer has put in huge hours underwater to get that moment. Or, or they were just lucky, you know, which is also part of it. Um, all those things deserve merit. But it's, I think you judge each within its genre. So is that the most amazing step forward in rec photography or is that the most amazing step forward in behavior photography is how you sort of weigh them up perhaps against each other which one is pushing the genre on but right. we'd obviously want both in our winning circle of course um i think in terms of technical innovation and pushing things on definitely judges like to be able to 
because when you're judging and choosing winners, you do feel that pressure. Is this the right winner? Because, you know, I think the thing I haven't made clear is that, you know, UPY, you know, we got 5,500 entries this year. Most of our entrants are really good photographers, you know. So I would say 5,000 plus of those 5,500 are the best pictures of the best photographers. So there's no dummy pictures. Um, so you could, you know, really put any of those together and it would be a collection worth seeing. Mm -hmm. So you're looking for small details and it's, it's actually a very heartbreaking process as photos that you absolutely love and you would have given anything to have taken yourself. You have to not award because right. there's just not space. Um, but I do think as a judge, when it comes to trying to pick the right one, it's quite nice to say that's really a technical innovation. You know, when someone's gone that extra mile with a technique, it, it helps reassure that you've made a good choice. But it absolutely has to work visually. Um, the, the, the technique that, that Joe used for his shot, just um, um, come back to that, the first time we ever saw that technique, I think the first time anyone used it, to our knowledge, was um, an Italian photographer called Davide Lopresti, who, who won overall UPY probably four years ago now with it. Right, yeah, um, I remember. Seahorse shot Seahorse. In the and that was the first snoop panning shot that I'd seen. Um, and, it, you know, because it, but it also worked visually. You know, if it, it, you know, the color balance between the yellow seahorse and the blue of the water was beautiful. You know, it was a great problem solver because it, it helped pull out this really beautiful subject from a relatively messy background. It visually had you know, a lovely feeling of this, this seahorse moving through the weeds. You know, it, it worked on all those levels. And those are more important than, than it was a new technique. But the fact it was a new technique also was nice as a judge to say, this is our overall winner. It looks amazing. It's graphic. It's innovative. There's a lovely narrative that works with the visual side of it. And we can also say, this is the first time we've seen this technique. That's a winner for us. Yeah. So yeah, yes, it, it comes into part of it, but I think it has to work visually first. And you know, if it doesn't work visually, it just goes out in the first round. It's like there's a million, you know, there's a thousand shots here that look amazing. If it doesn't look amazing, it's not going anywhere. Yep. So Alex, you've been bringing in uh, throughout your underwater photography career lots of uh, different techniques. At your early stage, where have you been looking for inspiration to? bring your photography to the next level? I, I would say the answer to that is, is everywhere. Um, I think that one of the best things you can do as an underwater photographer is to look at lots of underwater pictures because I think that, first of all, that builds up a bank of when you see a subject, you go, oh, I know what I can do with this subject because I've seen, you know, behind you guys, there's a, you know, a great man's shot coming onto the camera. That's a great angle. You know, okay, that's in my next time I see a manta. I'm going to maybe try and get into that position or, or whatever. But I think in terms of innovation, you want to look outside your own area of, of, of art. So, you know, and you can, you know, for me, I would say the, the area I've got the most inspiration from is other nature photography outside of underwater photography. So looking at that, um, just seeing techniques and trends. Um, one of the, 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 the trends that, that, that I brought in, into underwater photography that's kind of gone off in a slightly different direction now was playing around with the out of focus bokeh lights in the background. But I, I wanted to do that shot with natural background, not with, I'm not a big fan of artificial elements in the pictures. And so actually the way I did that was I, I knew I had to shoot open aperture. The best background I was going to get was the sun on the surface of a macro shot. And I had to use a housed flash to allow myself to use a shutter speed of a thousand, well, I think it was two thousandths of a second and still be in a sync because with a, a, a land flash in housing, you can do that high speed flash. And I created some shots like that. And then people have sort of taken that visual idea and, and done it a lot in the last few years with backgrounds. Um, but that idea came from seeing land photographers shooting flowers, shooting birds against water and having the sun playing on the water. And, you know, so that was very much influenced from that idea and going, I can take that idea and try it underwater. And then I had to come up with ways to figure out how to do it. And actually the way I figured out isn't the best way to do it. I now shoot those shots by using neutral density filters, which are a lot cheaper than housing a land flash. Right. I didn't really like think of that at the time. Um, so I, ideas, you know, come come from those areas. Um, I think, but it's also really important just just to be open um, to ideas. But for me, there needs to be. It's not just about creating a, a gimmick shot. I want a reason 
why I want... So the picture has to work visually, but there has to be a narrative reason. I don't want it just to look fancy. I want the, the fanciness in the picture to reinforce the message that I'm trying to say about, about the subject um, in, in term, terms of the shot. Um, so, for example, I, I did a lot of early work with remote flashes on shipwrecks. And th that was driven, yes, because it looked fancy, but it was actually about opening up space and creating atmosphere and that spooky feeling inside a wreck, while at the same time having color and contrast and detail to really be able to tell a story in the picture. So those, those aspects, and, and that led me to do a lot of work developing flash triggers and, and things, things like that. But I, I would say from my perspective as well, technological innovation drives a lot of my photographic creativity. Mm -hmm. So I like working with manufacturers, particularly the two areas that really interest me is, is optics underwater and lighting underwater. And so working with manufacturers who are developing new products, developing new optics, you know, whether it's macro, super macro lenses, whether it's wide angle lenses, those can drive me to you know, be able to shoot in different ways or playing around with, with different lighting solutions, whether they're off camera, on camera. And a lot of my well-known or celebrated pictures have come from me getting my hands on new technology and thinking, right, this can create this type of shot and then finding the subject that's going to really work with that look and that feel. So that drives And then the final area that I think I really want to mention is I, I'm a big student of the history of underwater photography. Um, back there, there's, I've got, you know, two shelves of underwater photography books, um, which, you know, you can buy old underwater photography books, you know, for a couple of bucks from secondhand yeah. shops online. And um, throughout that, I love reading those old books and seeing some of the ideas people played around with in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. Um, and a lot of the time, they couldn't really get them to work brilliantly. But because they didn't have digital cameras and they could see how things work. And you can go back into the Yeah, find, find their ideas and then bring them back into underwater photography with a real polish um, that they just couldn't do at the time, create visually really, really interesting images. That's a good idea. Um, so that's been another really rich area of inspiration for me. Um, I have to say, I'm, I'm probably a bit less creative now than I was five, six years ago. I think it's perhaps the change of, of lifestyle, um, of having a kid, the nature of my trips being more, you know, I think my focus now in my photography is is to earn a living doing it. Um, you know, people talk about pros and, you know, for me, being a professional, as you guys I'm sure say, it's not about making money, it's about the pro stands for pro for profit. You know, it's about making profit. And so managing my life to make sure that what I'm doing is, is generating a profit, not just generating money to live on, is it has become a slightly more, and I'm not as, as interested as playing around with those new ideas as I was a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And I think that's just more because my, my focus has, has had to move into other areas. Right. Um, I still try and do innovative stuff, but I think I, I spend a lot of time also just shooting really nice pictures that I know will earn me money. Rather right. Than... And what, um, which magazines and things are you working with at the, at the moment? You, are you still doing a lot of magazine work or when, when you say shooting images yeah. for, for that sort of thing, are you doing projects outside of underwater, the main underwater photography media? So, uh, the answer to that question is anyone who pays well. Right. Um, it's, you know, I'm, I think having a daughter made me aware of the, how time limited I am and also the fact that, you know, I need to provide for my, my family. So it actually made it easier for me to focus my, my work down to the things that actually pay and things that, that don't. Um, and I think there's that, that balance between time spent and money in. Right. And so, you know, my photography is, is morphed into, into those areas. So I worked for a number of magazines. Um, I don't really love writing. Um, I enjoy seeing articles written, and, and I, I write lots of articles every year. But I find writing is much slower for me than it, taking pictures. Right. So I really like, you know, my ideal situation would be to supply pictures to magazines but never write. Um, but I, I, for the last well, probably 10 years, I've written relatively few features, probably less than 10 a year, uh, maybe, 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 maybe less than 12 a year, I would say. But I write columns all the time. Right. So I write column in the UK and I write column in the US every month um, for the magazines. And columns I find very easy to write because I'm writing my opinion. 
Um, so, you know, like I've been spouting off here, you know, I can't be wrong, in my opinion. Right. So I just spout it off and the column's done. And I know underwater photography well enough that I know, you know I'll be sharing lots of useful stuff. I may not have the definitive answer, but a column is kind of not supposed to be like, a book right. needs to be definitive. Yep. A column is just, that's my take on it right now. And so I, I like writing that. It's also good because it's a regular income. You know, magazines, as you well know, Mike, they're very slow to pay. But if you're doing something for them every month, they're also paying you every month. Yeah. It may not be for that month, right. but it's come money. Coming. It'll eventually um, get there. But really diverse. I mean, you know, I, I still do pretty okay with stock sales. You know, I wouldn't, you know, I could live on it, but I couldn't travel and live on it. I right. think that's the big challenge. You know, you used to be able to, you know, live on it and, and travel and do all the photography as well. Um, but my travel is predominantly running workshops. So I... I guess the way I run my business is, you know, is I get my time in the field funded by running workshops. It limits my photography to some degree, but doesn't completely stop me shooting. It's probably why I don't do so much creative stuff now, because that requires you to be able to control a bit more. Right. Whereas time. shooting nice pictures, you know, you go on a shark dive, all the group wants to shoot the sharks. You go off and take amazing pictures of sponges. You know, it's not the most exciting thing, but then you can sell your sponges pictures or whatever it is. So, um, it's, yeah, so that way I, I get my time in the field and then, you know, but it's, yeah, I, like I'm, I, on Friday I got an email from a hotel group who wants to buy like abstract underwater pictures for, to use in like lots of hotel rooms. So that, um, you know, sent their stuff off yesterday. Um, I do a lot of magazine stuff. I sent articles off last week. Um, then just still images to magazines. Right. So the best magazines to work for that for me for the art for diving is um, the US magazines generally have the best rates still followed by the German ones. And then some of the better European ones still pay, you know, UK and things pay well beyond that. Most people aren't paying. So you're not seeing, I would say if you don't see my stuff in their magazine, it's probably they're not paying. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good way to put it. Yeah. Yeah. So. And that's the right way. Uh, yeah. yeah. No, I mean, I mean there's lots, there's lots of work going into that. And, uh, you know, like, unfortunately, I mean, also, like, for this, to have respect also of your uh, colleagues, uh, say that uh, they do this uh, as a full time job, you know, you always uh, should ask uh, to get paid for your work. Yep. Yeah. And, and that's also why I believe competition judges should be paid. You know, if, if I was giving my time and my pictures away for free, you know, the rest of the underwater photography community began, why are you doing that? Yet, people are expected to put their time and name to competitions for free. And I think that's, you know, I think if competitions are charging money to enter, they should be paying judges. For I that agree. same reason. I one agree. of the reasons. And oh. I think we should all, like, stand up for that together. Um, but... Well, I think uh, we're, we're, we've probably taken up enough of your time by now. Why don't we, uh, why don't we leave with you with one... And we sort of touched on it earlier, but if you are entering, you're, you're Joe Public out there, and you want you you've got a whole selection of photos that you want to enter into a photo competition, whether it be nature photography, underwater photography, what have you. What would be your one recommendation? Just just one recommendation to a potential entrant: what they should be looking for in their own photos to throw in there if they could only just choose one well um i think first of I, I i can't enter it i can't condense it down to a single one right i think the first thing i'd say is, is have some fun with it you know competitions are very valuable to your career as an underwater photographer there's no no doubt about that but if you take them too seriously it can be very detrimental to both your well-being and and your career because you can become a real asshole which is <laughs> what the underwater world needs um so take the photography seriously put your time into choosing the good pictures but don't put too much pressure on the result you know judging panels are always going to choose weird stuff you know different stuff you know each time and the different judges you know there's some i've judged with some really amazing photographers who have who have unbelievably awful taste in photography the fact that a lot of competitions are chucking out huge numbers of images before the judges get to see them you know, it means there's a lottery factor to it. Um, so don't build the results up to be the be all and end all. Enjoy the successes, 
don't beat yourself up over the, over the, over the failures. I think that's the most important thing. In terms of entering your pictures, pictures that immediately grab your attention. Some advice I would say is tile your, you know, spread across the screen your favorite 20 pictures. Look at that screen, look away. Which are the ones that stick in your mind? Those are likely to grab the judge's attention quickly. Um, if you're allowed to enter 10 pictures, have a deal with your husband or wife or friend that you can choose five and they can choose five. And whoever's pictures do better in the competition from ones you've taken, um, they get to choose one more the next time and you get one less. So if, you, if your wife or husband does better than you in terms of entering your pictures in your 10, then they get to choose six the next time and you only get to choose four. <laughs> I like that. Um, and I think That's a good idea. This, because that disassociates yourself from the taking of it. People always enter too many pictures that were their most amazing moment underwater, but it's not their most amazing photo. Right. You know, I, I do quite a lot of of one to one coaching with people, and very rare. And I find again and again we find on people's hard drives pictures that are competition winners that they were never considering entering. And you know, we get them out there, we send them off, and and you know, they sometimes do nothing, sometimes do well. If I had all the answers, though, I'd be winning every competition. Yeah, so. Absolutely. It's, you just enjoy the successes when they come and don't take the defeats. It doesn't mean you're a bad photographer suddenly. It just means the judges are going in a different, you know, looking for something different that way. And having been on judging panels, there are quite a lot of idiots out there. So. <laughs>